Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> we have uh, two thoughts tonight. Um, Brother Glaze, Acts eleven twenty six. I have an open question for all of you who are Christians. How many are you? Where are all the Christians? Okay. My question to you is, can you be convicted of being a Christian? Can you get people to testify for you in a court of justice that you are indeed a Christian? If you were standing here this evening, can you get your peers, the saints, can you stand here and get someone to testify that indeed you are a Christian? Have you been convicted by your neighbors and friends of being a Christian? If um, the Taliban, uh, anybody else come in, are you going to be running in this direction? Or will you stand because you are a Christian. Will you take down? <clears throat> Can you be convicted by being just like Christ? Do you act like him? He did no sin. Neither was guile in his mouth. He didn't misbehave in any wise. Can you be convicted of that? Do you speak firmly, truly, and sweetly when you are talking one with another in your home, husband and wife, in the church, pastors, ministers, friends, saints of God? You say you're a Christian. You say someone will testify for you. You can be convicted of being a Christian, and you act just like him. You speak firmly, truly, sweetly. Uh, your nay is nay and your yea is yea. If someone asks you a question, you will answer truly even if it hurts you. Right. Now, I have been shopping. Brother Howard said, how much you pay for that? Why would he ask me that? Often, I, you, I, you know, I want, you, don't you trust me? But that's not telling him how much I paid for it. Don't you trust me? That's not telling him how much I paid for it. If he says, how much did you pay for that? I should say $5 or whatever I paid for, $57, whatever. I, I wish he wouldn't ask me that. But, you know, and then I think, I paid $96 for it, Pastor. And I'm thinking, I wish he wouldn't ask me that. He continues to ask me, and I wish he wouldn't ask me that. He continues to ask me, how much you pay for that? I, do I have to tell you how much I paid for it? I had that amount. How much did you pay for that? I don't like that, but it doesn't matter whether I like it or not. Can you be depended upon? Can you depend upon me? Can I depend upon you? Are you dependable? If there are some light bulbs out, can you be dependent upon to put the lights up? Or would someone have to call you and, uh, and remind you over and over and over because you're not dependable? If you're supposed to be at the job at 5 o'clock in the morning and you get there at 5.15, uh, 4.45 is good. 5.15, 5.30 is not good. <clears throat> I went to work 17 years, and I was always there before time. And the one time that I thought I was going to be late, I called and told them I will be late. But I got there before I was late because I was trying to get there. They could depend on me to be there. The principal can depend on me. She's in a classroom. You ask for Miss Howard at a certain time of the day, she's in a classroom. And that's exactly where I was.
can you be dependent? As you get older, are you getting sweeter? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> there are several of us who are uh, kind of over the 50 mark. And I always teach the teenagers now, you're not grown until you're 50. So you all are working upon it. You just graduated from high school. You got some years to go before you're grown. You need help along the line to get to 50. Now, I'm, I'm way over it. I've made it. I'm grown now. I'm over and way over 50. But you have a ways to go, and I do love young people. As you get older, sometimes you get irritable. You don't want to be bothered. You don't want to start speaking shortly. You don't want the little children, go, go sit down. You want the children to want to come toward you. As you get older, you want to be sweeter. Yes, sweeter. As the days go, oh, you want to be kind, gentle. Children can walk up. They can lean on you. They can touch you. Innocent little children, you smile down on them. You don't frown because you don't want to be bothered because you're too tired or you irritated or whatever it is. Remember, you have been convicted of being a Christian. Now, you just told me that. And I pray that your yay is yay and your nay is nay and that you are actually a convicted Christian. All right? Can your family and friends testify for you? Uh, would they hesitate? To speak for you. Would they have to think about it? If you are being convicted, would they say, well, I remember that time he or she. Well, she might be a Christian. I, listen, I need the neighbors, the folks in the, the police department, the people down at the water bill company, the power company. Everybody needs to be able to testify that you are a Christian, that you don't miss paying your bills. You don't mess around with your house note and the car note. You don't forget to buy groceries, however small it might be, but you take care of things that you're supposed to take care of. That because you're a, you're a convicted Christian. Mind you, not convicted criminal. You are a convicted Christian. Do they whisper when you're around because they don't know how in the world you react to whatever they're saying. When you come into the room, do everybody just kind of... When they walk up, do they stop? When you walk up, do they stop talking? Are they afraid to say what they were going to say because you are so grouchy? You are so difficult, Christian. And people have to stop. Or can they talk and you walk by, you're not even in their business. Can you walk by and not be saying, they talking about me, I they talking about me. But can you walk by, because they may not be thinking about you. Can you walk by and not accuse anybody of whispering about you just because two people are standing and whispering? Because you're a convicted Christian. All right, we want to talk on our second point about someone who suffered an indignity. Please read Acts 11 and 26, and then we're going to move from there. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They had assembled themselves, and they taught. And they were first called Christians then at Antioch. Why? Because they acted like Christ. They behaved like Christ. Now, here's a note. Christ did everything he was supposed to do as a Jew. He uh, went to synagogue. Do you come to church every time the doorbells are open uh, unless you just cannot? Are you? Jesus did. Remember, you're a convicted Christian. You just like him. And when the doors open, you're heading there unless something hinders you. He went to all the uh, feasts. He attended everything that was required of him. He did that. He was not slack. 
He was not lax. He didn't think there was something that was uh, too small for him to deal with or uh, something, a function that's too big. He attended them all because he was Christ. He showed up when they required him to show up. And he paid temple tax. We just asked him for a little tithes. No, tithes are not little. It's whatever you have. Tithes and a little offering. Tithes and over. Whatever you can do. Whatever is humanly possible for you to do. Remember, you're a convicted Christian. You're just like Christ. And Christ did everything right. Who did no sin. Neither was guile in his mouth. And his yea was yea. And his nay was nay. And he was dependent. Dependable. Dependent upon whatever you want to, however you want to use it. Christ was there. Did Christ talk about all the saints behind their back? Did he get with one apostle and talk about the other one? Did he? Two of them wanted to be, you know how people are, you get all in the flesh and you want to be somebody special and they let you preach one day and the next thing you know you want to be head of the preachers. You want to be the head preacher. Why can't we all just get along? They don't have to have no head preacher. Why can't we all just, if the Lord uh, touch you tonight, you preach. And I say, amen. amen. So I don't have to be, no, not you, not you, you, no, not you, you, no, not you, over here, you. No. I'm going to let the Lord have his way. If he has called you, then he will anoint you for whatever he wants you to do. And my second point is, are you an ambassador? Matthews 3, 1 through 12, brother. Are you an ambassador for Christ? Now, who was the original amb ambassador for Christ? John. Now, let's talk about John. I should see John's female and males. They just graduated from high school. I should see John's out there. Let me tell you. <clears throat> John's daddy, Zacharias, and Elizabeth, his mother, didn't have children. Elizabeth uh, was barren. But she became with child. And Mary became with child. So you all are Bible readers and you know what happened. And when Mary, <clears throat> excuse me, went to visit Elizabeth, her cousin, the, ch the child leaped in her womb. Why? Already filled with the Holy Spirit and recognized what Mary was carrying inside of her body. My Lord and my God. John was born to serve the Lord. John had one purpose. Glory be to God. John didn't get married and have children and grandchildren to trail behind and to jostle on his knee. John didn't have a house and a family. John lived in the wilderness. John didn't have nice cars or uh, 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 wagons or mules or whatever. He didn't even have what you would call nice robes and what have you. He just was covered with the, and he ate locusts. He had the bare, the bare minimal, the bare minimal. But who called him? Glory be to God. Who sent him? What was his life about? What did John do? He was an ambassador. He came making a way. He came making a way. He said, I'm not he. He can't make it away. Glory be to God. Can you be an ambassador for Christ? Can you? Can you take your little life and give it to God? Now, I'm not saying never marry or have a family. or I'm not saying anything like that. I adore my son-in-laws. I have four daughters. I adore my son-in-laws. I have one son, and I love my daughter-in-law. She's beautiful. They live in Germany. 
The others live here in America. I'm glad they're reproducing themselves. I love the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. I have three great-grandchildren. I rejoice. I thank God for allowing me to live to see great-grands. It's a blessing from God. John didn't get that. John didn't get a chance to live even what I, a little individual, a period, a dot in this world, John didn't even get what I got. But John came as an ambassador. John came for a special reason. He was the forerunner of Christ. He was the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and he was the Lord's what? Cousin. They were kin. But he said, when he came now, we understand the baptism. We are baptized unto Christ. But John was following the uh, Old Testament rules, the washing. And Jesus said, uh, let it be so. Because let, 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 let he was saying, I, I, how can I wash you? How can I baptize you? But Jesus, remember, followed all the rules. His ministry had now, his ministry began after that, after he was baptized, after Christ allowed the dove to come down and said, this is my beloved son. That's when his ministry began. When the Lord put his, this, this is my beloved son. Up until that time, John was considered a very important man. Even ask Elias, read for me, brother. Matthew 3rd chapter, verse 1. Through 12, I'll stop you in the middle. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right. Huh. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus Christ, is the king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. What a job. What a wonderful job to represent him. You don't want you, most of you are not concerned about representing, uh, 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 participating as an ambassador in the United States. Everything is so chaotic until you don't either, you, you just stay back and pray. You don't want to go nowhere represent. Okay, but he came represent Christ. Read, brother. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He Make actually lived out. He actually did. And he came, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He himself was preparing the way of the Lord. Read. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. Okay, you see what he was dressed in? Now, that sounds like itchy cool to me. <laughs> Out in the woods, in the, in the wilderness, and it's hot, and you got a leather belt, and that sounds very uncomfortable. Uncomfort the significance of his preparatory ministry cannot be overestimated. Can we overestimate the ministry of John, I say we cannot. Read, my brother. And his meat was <coughs> locusts and wild honey. Now, <clears throat> someone was telling us about honey uh, because we was trying to do honey, lemons, vinegar. What is it, dear? For some, for some for medicinal, medicinal reasons. All right, so in our research, it told us that the honey that you're getting off the shelves has been processed and reprocessed and processed again, and they may say it's pure honey, but it's pure processed. All right, so someone said, when you find honey that's got something in it, maybe a wing or, uh, or something, it, that's when you find your pure honey. It has not been strained and processed and what have you. Your real honey comes from someone who owns and raises bees. So if you don't get your honey from a beekeeper and you get the honey from Walmart, you're not getting the right honey. All right. 
You need pure, real honey for the medicinal purposes if they're going to make you feel better. And look, acid reflux. I understand real honey can dissolve it. Pure honey, well, you have to research and you have to find out uh, how to accomplish that. But John, I believe, was eating pure honey. That was his sweet. He wasn't eating cakes and um, muffins and all the stuff in the, the uh, uh, apple uh, turnovers and all the stuff that we just adore. John was eating pure, real, raw honey, and he was extremely healthy. He was healthy. Read, brother. Then went out of him, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to, the, to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to Why flee you from the wrath to come? John's message was so powerful. It drew even the Pharisees. His message was so repentye and stop it. Repent and be baptized. Repent. Get saved. Get saved for real. Get saved for real. Now, if you preach a powerful message, you'll be hated for it. But we must press the ballon. If you preach a powerful message and someone comes under conviction, instead of falling to their knees, they turn on you. I hate you for telling them the truth. Simply telling them the truth. You got a bad spirit. You're not behaving yourself. You need to pray. Saints of God, if someone preaches and you become convicted, go to the altar. They are not praying to hurt your feelings. They are praying to help you go to heaven. Amen. I'm not up here uh, trying to impress you with my ability uh, to preach. No, sir, no, ma'am, I don't have an ability. I want you to go to heaven. I want to go. I want to go to heaven with every ounce of my insides. With every ounce of my intelligence, I want heaven. I want God. I want him to be pleased with me. Anything can happen at any time. Automobile accidents. Something can fall out the sky and bop you on the head and you'll be through. I don't care what happens to me. I want to be ready. I want to speak softly, walk softly, behave myself in every situation. I want to act right. No matter what happens, I want to come out having done it right, even if I'm trembling. But I want to somehow have done the right thing. The right thing. John was a child of promise, whose birth had been announced by an angel Gabriel to his father, who was a priest. His birth was accompanied by the promise, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. You're talking about a man with a sheep thing, with something wrapped around him. Great! You might say, well, he was tacky. Great! He was walking. He didn't have a conveyance. Great! Glory be to God. He had nothing. Great! Great! Was John great? Glory be to God. Great! You see what they said about him. Read, brother. O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. You know what they said? That when John came, he'd already be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know of anybody else except for Jesus that was already, when they were born, filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said of him, of him that there was none greater. We have proof. We have the word. Jesus himself said there was none greater than John. Great? Great? He had nothing. He had nothing. He fought for Christ. He came making a way. He came explaining. He came telling us uh, there's one greater than I whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to tie. 
Look, now they weren't first cousins. You know what? I should have got some of the inheritance and all that or whatever it was. They were not bickering. John and Jesus didn't bicker. They didn't find, well, well, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, and I am too. They were not equals. Yet Jesus himself said he was greater than any man that had come. Jesus said that about him now. They were not bickering, saints of God. They were not uh, finding fault with one another. The one that was sent first, I think it was about six months in the, their ages. The one that was sent first did his job. The one that was born later did his job. They were cousins. None greater than John. That's Matthew 11. 11. Turn to Matthew 11, 11 through 19. I need to read that. During the Old Testament dispensation, this would imply that John the Baptist was the epitome of the message of the Old Testament itself. Remember, Jesus' ministry had not started. Read, brother. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Who said it? Jesus. Everything he said was right. Remember, his yea is yea, and his nay is nay. And if Jesus said it, it must be so. Read on. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if ye will, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was far for to come. All right, so young people, if you read the Bible, you couldn't understand what was going on, that's the explanation. He came, was dressed like him, and he behaved like Elias. Amen. And he represented the Old Testament, and Jesus was the new. Now, there are preachers in here who would uh, 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 touch me on the shoulder if that's incorrect. They would help correct me. The real significance of John seems to be his appearance in the wilderness of Judea. John's appearance, preaching a message of repentance, is in fulfillment of Isaiah 40 and 3. Give me Isaiah 40 and 3. Prepare you the way of the Lord. That was why John came. <clears throat> now, may I ask you, why were you born? What? What are you doing here? We know what John's significance was. What is yours? Why are you here? Why in the world were you born? Why did you come to this earth? What, pur what purpose? Why were you born? John knew his purpose. What's yours? What's yours, young people? What's your purpose? Have you sought it out? Have you prayed about it? Have you read the word and considered, what is my purpose? We know what John's purpose was. He fulfilled his. What is your purpose? What is my purpose? I was born to serve the Lord. When I was a naughty teenager, I was reading the word. I wasn't saved, but I was reading the word. I was a reader. And so I wasn't um, Getting anything spiritual, I was learning, because I was a reader, I was learning the word. That's all I was doing. I wasn't, but in his long suffering, in his pity, he redeemed me. Read, brother. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John, the last of the prophets of Israel, was now commissioned to prepare the way for the king. The reign of God was immediately to be made manifest in Israel in all its fullness in the person and the work of none other than the Messiah himself. John is presented as the prophet sent in the spirit of Elijah. His clothing, his manner of speech, his dynamic and often scathing preaching. <clears throat> Do we know what scathing means? Do we know what scathing means? 
preaching that cuts, preaching that slices away the world, preaching that attacks you, not the minister, the word of God that shows you yourself. It shows you your weakness. It'll show you your strengths. You just read, and you'll find yourself in there. You'll find yourself that you're not a Christian after all. You're not a convicted Christian. You might be a Sunday morning Christian. <clears throat> you don't do right all the week, but on Sunday morning you're sitting up in church and you pay tithes. But are you going to heaven? Paying tithes is good. It's necessary. Absolutely. Coming to church is good. But how are you acting during the week? How are you acting on the job? Can they convict you? Can they witness that you are a Christian? Can they witness against you? Have you uh, preached your life? Have you lived your life so convincingly that they can convict you, they can point the finger and say, that is a Christian? Right. Even the worst, even the worst, well, you know you can run into, you don't know who they are, you can run into some horrible people. But have you been a Christian? You ran into some real snakes in the grass, but did you behave like a Christian? You know, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about my dog. We have three German shepherds. I love those dogs. So you open the garage, and here they come. And the youngest one, now, the, the oldest one is a male. And you can feed him at your hand. He'll take it gently. The mother will take it out of my husband's hand, but she won't deal with me. She won't, she, I, I don't know if two women, two women in the same yard, I don't know if she, you know. I'm, I'm the head lady at the house, and so she stays back. And if I come out, she'll go another direction. But the guys and the young girl, they, they, they'll come on up to me. Okay, so I open the garage door, and I reach up on the shelf. My husband has snacks up there. And so I, I give uh, the big dog, the uh, alpha male, I can hand it to him any way I want to. He won't bite me. All right. So I give this little eight-month-old a snack, and doing the same way, <laughs> bit my thumb. The hand that fed her, the hand that paid for her, the hand that got her license, the hand that did all that for her, she bit it. Now, the same hand can have her evicted. All I have to do is say, honey, she can't stay no longer. She's got to go. He might cry, but he'll do it. <laughs> now, he loved those. He got videos over his phone. He don't have no picture of me on the phone. He got a picture of his dogs. <laughs> he got a picture of his dogs on his phone. All right, so that's how he loved those dogs. But what I want, want you to know is the enemy don't care. I'm, 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 the, I'm, I'm, I'm actually taking care. Look, I take... I, I love her, and she bit me. I love her. So when she bit me, I was like, oh, I'm standing there. And then I looked at her. I was thinking, then my whole spirit changed. I was thinking about, but nope, nope. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. It didn't even enter my heart to hit her, to do anything to her. It didn't enter my heart. I was thinking, pull myself back together. When you love something, you treat it right. She bit me. I didn't bite her. She bit me. I fed her. All right. Now, as people, that's how we got to act. You know, I didn't like being bit. I'm giving you a treat, and you bite me. That's how people treat you. Think about it now. Your co-workers, think about it. Even in the family, bickering amongst the brothers and the sisters. Think about it. All right, so we want to move right back to John. John presented as the prophet. John presented as the prophet sent in the spirit of Elijah. His clothing, his manner of speech, his dy uh, dynamic and often scathing preaching. We was talking about how it can offend you. Certainly depicts him in the lifestyle of Elijah. Okay, repent. 
means a change of mind that leads to a change of action or conduct and is basically a change in attitude regarding God and sin and is often accompanied by a sense of sorrow and as a result of God's mercy in leading men to it, the mercies of God. Therefore, John the Baptist's ministry is clearly seen as a time of preparation for the coming of Christ and the proclamation of his kingdom. He proclaimed the kingdom of God was coming. John's ministry was received with great enthusiasm. Everybody was excited about John there for a while in its early stages now. In its early stages, they were all excited about it. So great was his success that even many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came uh, to his baptisms, to the baptism. John rebuked them, asking them to give evidence of fruits, meat for repentance. John was looking for more than as intellectual, more than an intellectual change of mind. John was looking for a change of heart. Genuine repentance proves itself by the fruits of a changed life. Let's go to verse 13 through 17. Now, we want to talk about, <clears throat> he's going to read for me, we want to talk about what happened to John. John came for one purpose. We understand what that purpose was, do we not? Is there anybody who does not understand what I just said? We understand why John came. We understand that John came uh, as an ambassador and nothing else. John was born for this one thing. Then what happened to him? Herod. In the wrong, Herod was altogether in the wrong. John was fearless. He told him, you cannot have your brother's wife. He insisted, and he took her, and I think she went along for the ride. I think she liked what she was doing. All right, so then she turns out, and her daughter, his brother's daughter, his niece, if you will, danced. Now, he said, she had danced so until he said he would give her even to the half of his kingdom, whatever do you want. Now that was enough dancing for all the saints the rest of our life. <laughs> now, you know, <laughs> what must she have done? How did she move her body? How could she convince him? How could, keep in mind, this is his niece. This is his niece. How ugly. How nasty. This is his niece. And she danced so. He was so impressed and those sitting around that he said, I'll give you, just, just ask, what, just whatever you, God, you have danced tonight. Just whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Even to half of my kingdom. Enough dancing sisters for all of us. She danced enough, the rest of us can sit down. We, we don't have to dance no more. It's been done. It's, it's, it's been done. All right. So then she go back to her mother. Now, was her mother a nice lady? Was she a queen? Was she, who was she? She was naughty. And she instructed, look, if you have a good mother that's telling you no, don't do that. Don't resent her. Don't resent her because she knows what she's talking about. If you got a good mother that's warning you, if you got a good mother that's raised you a Christian, if you got a good mother that's hanging in there with you, look, I raised four girls, and that's, you can look at me and tell. They done beat me down. Four girls. They have worn me out. They have just, okay, so such a teaching such a preaching, such a keeping them close, such a protecting them. When I would call their name, I said, Deidre, Carmen, Bridget, and Shanna. Kept them right together. They played together. They did everything together. They was walking in the neighborhood. One of my neighbors saw them, and they was carrying a friend's little baby. And he said, I know it's not theirs. I know it's not one of theirs. He knew. He knew. 
I was convicted of being a good mama. I kept them close. I kept my eyes on them. If they wanted to go somewhere and it was proper, I took them. I stayed with them. I helped them. No overnight. Overnight? What? An overnight sleepover? You're going to sleep over here. You, no, we don't do sleepovers. Especially not girls. I didn't let Kevin do sleepovers. No, we don't do sleepovers. Anything that the devil can drag up can be found in a sleepover. The devil is low down, nasty, mean, dirty, ugly, stinky. Anything that you can think of, that's him. But if you don't have your eyes on them, mama, anything can happen. So if, if, if your mother is trying her best to keep the reins, because I know you want to get out, you think you're grown. I told you you can't be grown until you're 50. I know you want to do some things. Stay with your mama. Listen to what mama say. Daddy say, you ain't, it's not time for you to go out yet. Wait. If you got a good daddy, wait. And be respectful. And don't be mad. And look. I had one going to tell on me. I'll tell daddy. That's what she said. She actually said that. I said, well, okay. I'm going to give you something to tell him. All right. <laughs> so I had a switch. I was just going to just, just tap her up just a little bit. I really wasn't going really to do nothing to her. I didn't really like lie. I don't like whooping on nobody. So I was telling her, I'll tell daddy on you. Then I start. <laughs> I'm going to give you something. When he gets here. You're going to have something to tell him. I wasn't trying to hurt her. She got smart with me. All right, so you're going to tell on me? All right, then. I'm going to give you something to tell When Daddy gets home, we have something to tell him. And I've already taken care of the matter. It's been finished. It's over. It's done with. Now, one thing we did was double team the children. Double team the ch You don't get with me against Daddy. And you don't get with Daddy against me. All right, I'm checking one, little bitty one. I'm checking. Her. She took out across the den. She jumped in this lap. He was sitting on one end of the den. I'm sitting at the other. And, I'm, and she ran. And so he grabbed her up in his arms, splayed her across his lap, and I finished up. <laughs> She's going to run. All right. John was looking for more than intellectual change of mind. Genuine repentance proves itself by the fruits of a changed life. I want to be sure that each one of you are convicted of being a Christian. What happened to John after that? He was arrested for telling the truth. He was beheaded because he had the character to tell the truth. He was born for one purpose only. And why were you born? 